Exactly. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think we can hear me. Yes. And can Zoom people hear me? Are Zoom people admitted? Zoom awesome. Well, welcome. Hello and welcome to LISMA's May Partners Meeting, the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. Um, I'm Abby Bizretzik. Normally, Bill is doing this introduction, but he has to head out in a few minutes, so I'll be emceeing today. Um, we're really grateful to be presenting here at our office at the Sisters of St. Joseph in Brentwood. And thanks to everyone who is joining us in person and online. We have a smaller group today, but that means like twice the bagels that you guys need. And um, for those online, please keep yourselves muted during the presentations and put any questions in the chat. And for those in person, bagels are here. Coffee is ready, maybe. It will be ready eventually. It's not ready now. Um, and the bathrooms are in that direction if you need them. So here we go. This is our LISMA team. Uh, Bill Jacobs is our program manager. Uh, I'm Abby Bezretzik. I'm our conservation area manager. We're also joined by Melody Penny, who you'll hear from in a second, our early detection and rapid response manager, and Cassidy Robinson, our education and outreach manager. So you've met all the LISMA staff if you're here today. And these are our email addresses. Uh, if you didn't get the notice, we do have new email addresses since last year, all at lisma.org with our first name. So it's even easier to remember them before. Here's what we'll be doing today, uh, starting with a LISMA update from some of our field activities so far and plans for the field season. Um, then we'll be, be followed by Amanda Furcall, the land stewardship manager here at Sister of St. Joseph, giving a partner spotlight. Then some roundtable announcements where you'll be able to share some of your plans of invasive species management for the year, if you have any to share. Um, take a little break, more bagels. And then we have two presentations coming up, one on Bradford and calorie pairs from Dr. David Coyle, and another on um, remote sensing between uh, crossing the researcher practitioner gap to maximize the utility of remote sensing for invasive species monitoring and management from Kelsey Parker, a PhD, PhD candidate at CUNY Graduate Center. So jumping into it with our listener update. Uh, I, as a conservation area manager, have some updates in that regard. So in early spring, we were able to work at some new preserves to us, um, working with partners at Nassau County Soil and Water Conservation District at Mountain Town Preserve, and also with the Peconic Land Trust at Nisiquag Preserve and Wolf Preserve. So at Mountain Town Preserve, we helped create invasive species management recommendations for what they're facing there, being mindful of the sensitive salamander habitat that they have of vernal pools. So it's also very cool to see those vernal pools um, that can be found within the preserve. We were also pleased to tour the Nisquag Preserve and see the rich habitat that overlooks the river. We passed along some management recommendations for the few invasive species that they do have there, um, such as Viburnum dilatatum and red barberry and beech leaf disease. And lastly, after a workshop with the Peconic Land Trust that Cassidy will talk about, um, we toured Wolf Preserve and appreciated the work the Land Trust is doing to manage swallowwort on the property. They have a lot of that there and um, big infestation, but they're working, been working at it for many years and will continue to do so. Relevant to today's presentation on calorie pair, um, we also toured some calorie pair infestations back in April. We joined Tim Wenskis of the New York State DEC to see the extent of the calorie pair invasion in Staten Island. And while calorie pear has been planted in many areas, Staten Island hosts a large naturalized populations, both along the West Shore Expressway. If you've ever driven down there in early, early spring, you'll see these white trees everywhere. Um, and also in parks like the Mount Loretto unique area. So the staff there has been working to manage it one stand at a time and find that in early spring when flowering is the best time to see their progress. So this is standing at the top of the hill, looking down at the unique area over a field. And you can see that there's a lot of it. Uh, I'll put it here, just in that whole forest that you can really, ooh, it really stands out. That's us, that's one up close. And for some reason we're upside down. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> really that's, I, that's not how I made my slides. Um, <laughs> so we're looking forward to hearing more about calorie pair today from Dr. David Goyle. And already this season, we've had some fun days on the water. Um, we checked out Penny Pond in Hampton Bays, where the Phragmites had been reported, and we found none. Um, so that was a success already, but we'll check back in the growing season. We're also been doing monitoring and management for Ludwigia Pepploides on Artist Lake with the town of Brookhaven. Um, there on the right. And uh, we found and removed only eight individuals and observed a lot of the native uh, Ludwigia palustris. This is a site that we'll continue to return to and expect to see more um, Pepl Ludwigia peploides 
emerge uh, as the growing season comes, but we'll be there to uh, do some early detection and rapid response with whatever we see. As more, yeah. And so we also uh, commenced a new project with New York City Parks and New York City H2O to manually manage Labugia pipolides at Wolf's Pond in Staten Island. We we're happy to join them to do some surveying of the area, and give some recommendations on how uh, they could work with their volunteers to manually control it. While it can be found scattered around the shoreline, um, it seems that the, their coordinated volunteer efforts will make an impact there. And lastly, just so some brief overview plans for our field season as far as conservation areas. Some water body surveys will be continuing, also continuing our projects for proactive Phragmites management. So areas where there's very small stands that we can control manually that impact um, otherwise really sensitive habitats. Well, we get Epiletes continuing, as I mentioned, some uh, surveying our invasive species prevention zones. And also uh, we have our own little swallow art project at Otis Pike State Forest containing that as much as we can. And now I'll pass it over to Melody as she talks about early detection and rapid response. Thank you, Abby. Uh, my name is Melody Penny. I'm our early detection and rapid response manager. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our plans for field season. Recently, LISMA delineated a small manageable infestation of orange candleflower or arum italicum at Wolf's Pond Bluebell, property of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Our EDR manager, myself, made contact with uh, the New York City DEP in partnership to remove the, this high impact species. And it was rapidly managed by the New York City D DEP, which was great. Um, it was a perfect example of early detection and rapid response. Um, next, we worked on uh, Juliana's Barberry. We delineated a mature but manageable infestation of Juliana's Barberry at Miller's Pond County Park. Um, this is property of Suffolk County Parks. We contacted the landowner and we're awaiting our next steps for possible management of this species. We also returned to Crab Meadow Beach in Fort Salonga to further delineate a sizable infestation of slender leafy spurge as a follow-up to a 2022 survey. The infestation unfortunately spread beyond eradication abilities. Um, so we're working with the town of Huntington on possible containment efforts. And our plans for the field season we plan to work with small carpet grass or Arthraxon hispidus um, at Montauk County Park. We have plans for hopeful management of the species uh, with the Third House Nature Center. We also have plans to work with New York State Parks to delineate an infestation of wild teasel at Bethpage State Park with hope for management as well. We have plans to follow up with the town of Brookhaven on management of flower, uh, small flowered tamarisk at Cedar Beach. They're gonna be managing that this year. Uh, we have continued monitoring and management of floating water primrose or Ludwig Ludwigia peploides at Artist Lake, Middle Island, and continued monitoring and surveying of other EDR species such as invasive yam, fuzzy dutia, trifoliate orange, Christmas berry, and plume poppy. And I'm going to pass this over to Cassidy now. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Cassidy. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at LISMA. I'm going to talk about some events for education and outreach that we've been up to and some upcoming events for the summer. So we've been doing a lot of tabling uh, recently, uh, engaging with the public this spring. On Earth Day, I tabled at the Quad Wildlife Refuge Earth Day celebration shown on the right. Uh, below is Melody and Maggie tabling at, tabling at the Farmingdale plant sale, talking to gardeners and students about native and invasive species. Uh, and on the left is at the Peconic Estuary Partnership Conference that Abby and I attended uh, and tabled at to share invasive species knowledge and resources with some professionals. The whole team also tabled at the Limpy Plant Sale this past weekend and had a chance to show off some real life invasive species through the Weed, uh, weed Wagon, which is a collection of live invasive species specimens kept for educational purposes by the Cornell Cooperative Extension. So that was pretty cool to show off to people. Done some presentations recently as well, gearing up for the field season. Uh, we've, been, we've been connecting with different groups, such as environmental clubs and professionals. Uh, we recently gave a presentation for the Peconic Land Trust staff on how to write management plans for invasive species management. Uh, following the slideshow, we took a, a walk at Wolf Preserve, as uh, Abby mentioned, uh, to identify some species and illustrate how to prioritize uh, conservation goals before writing the management plans. Melody and Bill also gave a presentation to the Farmingdale State College Horticulture Club on an introduction to invasive species. 
uh, and not shown here. I also presented to my local garden club at the Lindenhurst Memorial Library on another uh, introduction. So some upcoming events. Save the date uh, for the upcoming Invasive Species Expo in Saratoga. Uh, this three-day conference will have something for everyone. Uh, Sunday is the Farmer's Market Community Day um, for the general public with lots of fun activities. Um, while Monday and Tuesday are professional development days for any professionals looking to sharpen their invasive species knowledge and skill set. Uh, Abby's doing a great job planning this event, and I highly recommend attending. It'll be a lot of fun and very educational. Uh, they're also still accepting calls for abstracts uh, for presentations at the expo. Feel free to connect with us after the meeting or email us if you want to find out more about that. Another more imminent upcoming event. Oh, I didn't mention the, the date. That's on September 24th to 26th. <laughs> so save that date. Uh, more imminently uh, is New York Invasive Species Awareness Week from June 5th to 11th. Uh, NYSA is a great way for professionals and community members to learn more about invasive species. Uh, here's the calendar of some of the local LISMA events uh, and webinars offered during NYSA. Um, and this is from June 5th to 11th. I think I mentioned that. Uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the LISMA webinar this year, we're putting on a presentation called Aquatic Explorers uh, aimed at a general audience, including families and kids. Uh, so tell your friends. Uh, that will go over an introduction to aquatic invasive species on a fun interactive virtual lake survey. So we'll be recruiting the help of the audience to actually identify what we would pull up on this uh, virtual rake toss. Uh, we also hosted a poster contest uh, this year for NYSA with the theme of invasive species prevention, and we received about 70 uh, creative posters from kids ranging from about 4th to 12th grade. We're going to be announcing those talented winners during NYSA. Our partners are putting on some great events too. There will be an event at the Riverhead Aquarium, uh, as well as a water chestnut pull at the Massapequa Creek hosted by the DEC, uh, and two invasive species removal events hosted by the North Shore Land Alliance. Check out the LISMA website to register and find out more about these great events. Uh, we'll also be sending out our newsletter in a couple of days at the end of the month, uh, where we'll list all of the virtual and local events for NISA. If you're not already signed up for our newsletter, feel free to write your email down on the sheet by the door, or if you're on the virtual call, email us. But you've probably heard about this through the newsletter. But yeah, let us know. Um, Abby, hand it over. Tom Algeyer also commented um, that the deadline to submit abstracts for that expo is today. So um, if you have an idea, just put it down right now. Okay, so now we'd like to welcome Amanda Furkall, who is the landscape ecologist at the Sisters of St. Joseph. Amanda is a Long Island native who earned a Bachelor of Science in Conservation Biology from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry. She then went on to get a Master's of Public Administration from CUNY Baruch, and she has experience working at land trusts to preserve and protect wild places. Her career path has also included a role as direct, executive director of Friends of Hempstead Plains, a nonprofit dedicated to the restoration of the only prairie east of the Appalachian Mountains. At the Sister of St. Joseph, her role as landscape ecologist includes a variety of initiatives, including forest and meadow stewardship, woodland restoration, stormwater management, and native garden design. There are sustainable landscapes and open space throughout this campus, and Amanda aims to manage this mixed landscape in a holistic way, integrating the human community with the natural community. So that's that for an introduction. Well, please welcome Amanda. Good slides. I do have slides. Oh, oh look, I have a picture. <laughs> I'll got please hold as we do the slide. <laughs> Okay. I've also emailed it. Great note, but I don't know who's your old email. Uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll get that. Up. You need to email it to Melody. <laughs> uh, Oh, is that it? Look at you. 
Just in case. Just in case. Just in case. That. Enter this one. Joe. From the beginning. Okay, that's good. And can people online see that screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here's Amanda. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being patient. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about one of our new projects on the campus. Um, I'm calling it our North Woods Restoration Project. Uh, we received grant funding from the DEC through the Regenerate New York grant. Uh, it's a little over $30,000 and we have three years to complete it. Uh, and for those of you doing this kind of invasive work, restoration work, you know the multi-year grants are gold. Um, so this grant is for reforestation, restoration, invasive species management. They also actually fund um, deer exclusion fencing, but knock on wood, we don't have deer on this property right now. I believe they just opened up another round of this funding. So if anybody's interested, I believe that is available. Okay, so you can see um, we are working in stands three, four, and five. Um, the orange, we're having that meeting in those buildings right now. Um, so it's just north of us. And it's a total of a little over 11 acres. It's adjacent to our agricultural easement lands. Um, so there's actually a lot of people who come to volunteer, to work on the farms, to explore, to buy fresh produce. So it's an area where um, we're very uh, intersected with the community there. But those woodlands are fairly degraded. They're, especially through Stand 4, there actually used to be a railroad line that went there. Um, the LIRR goes um, right, is like just north of what this photo shows. And a rail line used to come down and deliver coal to the convent here. So, you know, again, with the old buildings and it's so important when you're doing restoration work like this, I think, to understand as much as you can about the history of the property. So that old rail line and now a power easement has really caused a lot of invasives to spread in that area. Yep. So I wanna show a few pictures of what these woodlands looked like before. Um, this is sort of a, a wintry picture, but that foreground there is all euonymus burning bush um, and pretty impenetrable. Another picture, lots of multi-floor rows. Yeah, um, the before shots are often just, it's. It's green and it's, but it's not the good green. Come on. <laughs> um, we have in the overstory, there's a lot of black locust, Norway maple. Uh, and I was just discussing with a few people before we got started, all the Alanthus. And we got spotted lanternfly for the first time last summer. And once we saw one, we were seeing hundreds of them. Um, not quite as bad as some of the worst infestations I've seen in, you know, online, the, the, ones where there's thousands on trees, but certainly once we found one, we were finding a lot. Um, as you may know, Alanthus Tree of Heaven is one of their favorite host plants. Um, so they're really happy to be sucking the sap out of those fast growing trees. Um, and we had a lot of them in there, especially because we had one giant female Alanthus that had clearly been planted here. Uh, it was putting out, I'm sure tens of thousands of seeds every year a really huge monster tree. And we finally took that out um, just a couple months ago, which was wonderful because there's really no point in doing all this restoration work here and managing the Alanthus if we don't get that seed producing, that giant seed producing tree out. Um, there's also some positive, uh, good, wonderful native trees in the overstory there. A few different species of oaks, white pines, a few older pitch pines and sassafras. The understory is a lot of multi-floor rose, honeysuckle, bittersweet, burning bush, um, a little bit of wisteria, which is my, my least favorite. It's really quite aggressive. Um, but there's also some spots where there's 
beautiful huckleberry stands. So there's lots of potential here. And you can see we started with um, some monitoring points, um, those little red dots um, to sort of get a sense of what this area started like before, because being a disturbed landscape and these narrow little parcels, each spot can be quite different. Um, each acre looks quite different than the acre next to it. So we really wanted to get a good sense of the baseline information, and we've collected lots of data. Um, basically, we did sample points based on the observed de density from aerial maps of the forest stands. We did variable area plots for the overstory um, with a basal area factor of 20, um, 20 gauge. The understory, we did uh, 100 acre plots um, and around those sample points for the overstory. We looked at species composition and abundance, and we just rated the abundance of particularly those invasives on a scale of zero to five. I'm personally not a big fan of the um, percent cover ones. I think people are notoriously bad at estimating percent cover, and uh, I think the one to five scale worked really well for us. So you can see those plots again. And then we did our first treatment. We came in with a forestry mower um, or forestry mulcher. There's a few different names for it, but you put this pecan head on the front of a bobcat. We hired somebody to do this who um, has a lot of experience doing this kind of work. And it mulches up trees, um, at least depending on the type of tree, if it's a little rotted or um, what wood it is, eight inch diameter. Um, that head lifts up so it can sort of knock trees over and chip them in place, which was so important in an area where we needed a first big cut. You saw those areas that were just impenetrable. We couldn't physically get in them easily, and we would have needed a small army of volunteers to even start. So this is good at kind of starting to clear that space. Um, we spent, we uh, had... 40 hours with the forestry mower going. And this is a little bit of a before and after. Um, so you can see that the it started out with vines and small trees growing up everywhere. And the forestry mower can kind of get in there, get in between and start cutting. All those vines are now hanging and we're starting to see a lot of good uh, open space where we can actually get in and start doing some of the management by hand. Um, similar thing here, lots of small trees and vases in the understory, some spots where you can't really see what's behind it at first um, with the multiflora rows growing over everything, and then it's opened up. Um, this area by our compost uh, area, the left picture was actually taken in the fall, and you can see all those young Alanthus trees coming up. Um, and then the mower kind of comes through and takes down that first big section. Um, and then these, I uh, showed you that first bit of uh, Euonymus in the front, and then taking a picture now, that's just not there. It's just gone. Um, and we'll see what things look like, what regenerates, right? You cut these things back. I'm sure you all know if you cut these perennial vines, bittersweet or wisteria, you can cut it at the base and it's still going to come back. It'll be much weakened, but we're now really doing a lot of monitoring to see what's coming in. But we're seeing some great things like this little stand of Indian hemp that is spreading in this area that was clearly just torn up by the forestry mower, but because their rhizomes are under the surface and they're pretty, it's a pretty tough, hardy plant, it was very happy that the space was cleared for it. Um, so next steps are going to be um, hiring a company to do some herbicide work, um, doing a little hack and squirt on the rest of the Alanthus. And we would also like to use some trap trees. Speaking to the Lisma staff, um, that seems like it may be one of the best options um, to be able to control the spotted lanternfly. So um, killing off as many of the female trees as possible, and then leaving a couple, one or two male trees to attract all the spotted lanternfly, and then 
um, using a pesticide to kill them at that point. So we're hopeful that this will make a big difference, especially because we're right on farmland here. We're trying to manage the invasive uh, spotted lanternfly, especially to protect our farmers um, from having to losing crops, from having to deal with egg masses on their on the products they're selling, which brings them under um, uh, ag and markets regulations. So um, that's sort of the big sort of piece of doing the invasive species management. But ultimately the goal here, because this is a degraded ecosystem and it's near this community area, ultimately we'd really like to be doing something in the food forest, permaculture, foraging realm. We have so much um, community integration here and it's a really lovely place for um, the farmers to be able to teach people how to grow mushroom logs and to do some wild foraging and to plant perennials. And a lot of the farmers here have been really interested in working with the woodlands and taking care of more land than their, um, than their agricultural plots. And I really see that as a great way to do community forestry and community land management um, because as the sisters always say, um, we're not really comfortable with saying we own this land. We hold this land in sacred trust for the next generation. And we hold it in sacred trust for the whole the whole human and more than human community that's here. Um, that's my little spiel on this project. Um, any Any questions on this restoration project, where we're going with it? recommendations on how to deal with all the different invasives I mentioned. Great. Um, yes. That device and the machine seems to bring that to a five jack. Yep. Uh, if you were trying to get rid of when it's had rhizomes, like their bodies, would they be affected in terms of interrupting those roots? I think generally no. The the machines really meant um, the the teeth on it get damaged once you're kind of getting too much into the sand and dirt. It's really not meant to be like digging. It can kind of scrape the surface. Like if you have English ivy on the surface, it will knock some of it back, but you will get some regeneration of that. So yeah, it's a good question. Trying to um, find the right tool for the right stage and the right species um, is always something that I'm kind of uh, battling with. And um, this is a a big um, sort of blunt instrument. So it's the thing you I tend to use first. Um, and even with a really great uh, machine operator, it always makes a little bit of a mess. And then you're kind of going back by hand and doing the detail work. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's Andrew Gladys at Gladys Farms. Um, I know a couple other organizations like North Shore Land Alliance have used him for different things. Um, so he's he's a farmer, but because he has all this farm equipment um, and cares about conservation and restoration, he also kind of has this as a, as a side job. So um, yeah, really, really wonderful um, contact that I've used for many years. Thank you. Did you follow up with cut stump treatment with any, any of this stuff in the road or not? We haven't. Um, the way this cuts things, I'm interested to see how much regrowth we get um, because it it's, doesn't cut smooth like a chainsaw. It's really gouging at things. So I'm interested to see if we get any regrowth on or if we get much regrowth on things like the Atlantis. Um, I'm expecting to get very little. Yeah. Yes. So if we had a site that had, uh, like you showed, orders of multi floor rows, very thick, mm -hmm. that machine would be able to penetrate through there? Yeah, e multi floor rows easily. You might not even need, you could probably even go with something um, uh, even a little bit less intense. Um, there are different types of brush cutters and, and things you can use. Um, this is really wonderful for trees, but it'll certainly go through uh, scrubby brush. The only thing that um, this kind of machine struggles with is if uh, perhaps there is 
concrete dumped in the woods. Um, I don't know what everybody's different sites are like. <laughs> Many of the sites I've worked on, uh, you may think you found everything, all the trash and things that are dumped in the woods. And I can guarantee that the um, forestry mower driver will find more. Um, so if you walk through the woods where this was done, you'll see um, orange spray paint on all the stuff that was hit by, you know, you can see where the forestry mower tried to mulch, uh, you know, a big block of concrete. Um, so it'll go through pretty much anything besides that. <laughs> anything else? Great. Well, if people are ever interested in what in this project and what they're what we're doing on this campus in general, my email is furcall at csjbrentwood.org, F-U-R-C-A-L-L. -L, and I'm happy to answer questions and give tours anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Just put the next slides back up. Yeah, good. Okay, so now that we've had our partner spotlight, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we'll move on to roundtable announcements. So um, this is your opportunity to share any news updates plans, management actions, or outreach activities, if you have a nice uh, plan you haven't told us about, we'd love to know about it, uh, related to invasive species. Um, since we have a kind of small group here, we'll just go one by one and um, just tell us your name and organization and then your update. So we start with Charlotte. Hi, my name is Charlotte Brennan. I'm from North Shore Land Alliance. We've been doing a ton of invasive work recently. Um, we've been doing a lot of mile a minute removal at some of our different preserves, and we, we released mile a minute weevils probably like three years ago and we're continuing to see pretty substantial damage from the weevils so that's super encouraging um we have two events like they shared for invasive species awareness week which we're really excited for we're having a mile a minute one of course at red coat in oyster cove and then we're having another one uh japanese knotweed removal at the roosevelt preserve in roosevelt and something else really exciting is that Lizma is giving um, an invasive species uh, presentation to our core volunteers for the Land Alliance. So I'm really excited to help get them trained a little bit better and be more effective stewards of all preserves. Yeah. Rich, you're thinking of My understanding is we have some land removal coming up on Southern State Parkway. Mm -hmm. That's really about all I have to Great, great to know. Amanda, you know, you're you're chewing now, but also you gave a nice one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm at Reagan. I'm with yeah, an organization called Save Green South Bay. Um, one of the things that you are looking at involving invasives is adjacent to trees and trying to address uh, game plans when we see them. Mm. Great, thank you. Joe Benman, uh, no innovation to me, but uh, I've been quality thought. Lately, I've been doing, the last three years, I've been working with Lindsay on native plants. Mm -hmm. Yes, very important oxidant to native plants. Thank you. Uh, Andy Marcella, also with Save the Great South Bay. Uh, we're concerned about invasives in the marine environment, but also because we, uh, work on most of the creeks that run into Great South Bay. Uh, one of the common invasives we run into is uh, Japanese knotweed. And uh, you can uh, advise us on uh, more effective ways of permanently removing it. Uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's a really hard one. But we have some ideas. <laughs> Probably you've tried them. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any? Uh, Okay. 
as an optimist. Can you remind me of the three by three method that's cutting three times a year, three times a season? Just Mm. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming. Let me know how that works too. Okay. And I think we have um, some virtual uh, attendees who are invited to also share. Um, I'll since we only have uh, ten people virtually, I think we could probably go through the list, and I'll call you out. You can feel free to unmute yourself if your microphone isn't working for a reason. You could also put an update in the chat, or if you prefer to do an update in the chat, please do that, and I could read them out. Um, so first on our list, uh, we have Alice, uh, Gittler. So if you have any updates to share about invasive species management, um, and your plans for the season, feel free to do so. Hi there. Um, this is actually my very first meeting. So I've just come to learn, um, and start to get involved. I'm actually in the parking lot and I have no idea how to get in the buildings. So. <laughs> anyway. oh, okay. Well, but I'm listening in, so thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We'll let you in right now, and you can join us in person. <laughs> but um, which which entrance is it? Is it just this very main entrance here with the archway? Uh, probably. Building two. Um, Amanda is coming out to open the door for you, so. Uh, awesome. Okay, I'm sorry to, to yeah. Thank you for letting us out. Thank, thank you for joining. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, as Alice will be driving us momentarily, um, can, uh, the next person I have on the list is Anahi Walton Schaefer. Uh, if you have any updates to share, you can unmute yourself and uh, yeah, welcome. I'm, I'm new to this. It's the first time. I'm very excited about being here and learning a lot. Thank you very much. I, I really don't have anything to add. Thanks. Thanks. Nice to meet you. And thanks for coming. Nice to meet you too. Um, next on this is Brooke Shellman from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Do you have anything to share? Hi, yes. So um, we actually have, we're trying to work on recruiting invasive species volunteers to help with our management efforts at the Long Island National Wildlife Refuge Complex. So this Saturday, we're actually like actually hosting a workshop at the Wertheim. Uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Shirley. Um, it's going to be an invasive species identification workshop for those who are interested in learning more about invasives or also if they want to join our team of volunteers. Um, that'll be from one o'clock to three o'clock p.m. this Saturday. Um, and we are finalizing our plans for NISA, but don't have them quite finished just yet, but <laughs> I will send those out as an update. Great. Thank you. And yeah, so that this weekend, right? And um, so great opportunities yeah. this weekend and also coming up in the future, right? Yep. Uh, it's this Saturday from one to three at work time. Nice. This Saturday, one to three at work time. Thanks. Great opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so next on the list, I have uh, Emily Adma. Do you have any updates to share? And after that, uh, Gavin Cohen. I want to step on Emily's toes. She uh, put a message in the chat, though. Oh. Um, uh, go ahead, Gavin. Okay. Yeah, I'm just here to um, to listen in today. I don't have any um, announcements or, or anything to convey. Thanks for giving me some time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, and Emily said in the chat she's a science teacher with the Belmore Merrick School District and is here to learn. So welcome. Um, next on the list, we have Leslie Moma. Do you have any updates to share? And after that is Sam Akinpora. Okay, uh, Sam, do you have anything to share? Yeah, can you guys hear me over there? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, I just got a new setup, so just making sure. Um, I'm Sam with the Central Pine Barrens Commission. A um, couple of updates. Fi our fire season just wrapped up pretty much. We burned around 300 acres of grassland, so it was a pretty successful year. Um, 
right now we have EDRR trapping set up. We're going to have another two weeks of that. Um, so we'll see what the results come out for that. And then we're also taking part of an SPB new lore trapping that the Forest Service is trying to figure out if there's a new lore that's going to be able to attract SPB better and more efficient. And besides that, we're just continuing surveying and monitoring and trying to suppress um, caper spurge and stilt grass at our encroachment sites. But that's pretty much what's on the docket for us this field season. Great. Thank you, Sam. Great to hear about new, uh, new initiatives with lures and can't wait to hear more. Um, last on the list, we have Yvonne Barris. Do you have any? Oh, yep. Go ahead. I see you're unmuted, Yvonne, but I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, still can't hear anything. I will read that um, Leslie Moma also put in the chat um, that she's a landscape architect with the DOT in Buffalo, and she's here to learn more on the topics presented today. So that's great. Nice reach we got there. Um, oh, Yvonne is a volunteer at Olympia and is also here to learn. So thank you. And lastly, um, Brooke put in the chat, if anyone's interested in more information about the volunteer opportunities on the upcoming workshop this Saturday from one to three at Wordheim, um, her email is Brooke Shellman at fws.gov. And we could write that down for those in person too, or talk to me after. So thank you so much, everybody. Great announcements. And um, there also, if you forgot anything, there's time at the end of these presentations to bring something up again, um, if something inspires you. Also feel free to put things in the chat. And now we'll take a little break, both virtually and in person. Coffee should be ready. And there's bagels for those who came late uh, and fruit. So thank you so much. And we'll, we, we will reconvene at 11 um, with our first presentation by uh, Dr. David Coyle. Thank you.